<laughs> Y'all, I was like, wait, is it my turn? Um, <laughs> it's my turn, honey. Um, can y'all hear me? Y'all can hear me? Awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, my turn is an actual, um, it's an old Aretha Franklin song. So um, shout out to Mother Aretha Franklin. So hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming to the summit this year. Um, I am Lady Dane Figueroa Aditi. I will be keynoting this morning as well as having um, a post keynote discussion with um, my Google sisters, Regina and Farah, and I'm super, super excited about that. So before I begin today, y'all, I want to read a little something that I wrote because oftentimes when I keynote, I'll do like a poem or an in, uh, in, invocation or to just really set, um, to really, you know, help help with my nerves but also to call into the space, um, what I would like to call into the space. So last year um, was a very, very difficult year for many, many people. Um, towards the beginning um, of June of last year, I had received some incredible news. And I felt a little bit guilty about that incredible news that I got at the time back then because I was, um, because there was also all of these other things happening in the world. Um, there was a lot of suffering in the world. And I'm a very spiritual person. I'm not saying y'all got to be spiritual people, right? I'm like not saying that. But for me, um, spirituality is deeply important. <clears throat> and I truly believe that my ancestors said to me this phrase, your sorrow is not more sacred than your joy. And I, of course, in the theater talk often about the ways in which I am not invested in trauma porn. Um, I am not invested in... Um, only stories about uh, Black people suffering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so as I think about what my ancestors said to me about my sorrow not being more sacred than my joy, I think about the fact that I have the right to also celebrate um, the things, the good things that happened to me. Um, I have the right to be a multidimensional being. I have the right to be multifaceted. And so from that, I wrote this piece. And I wanted to begin today by reading it to folks. And it's from a book I wrote called The Infrastructure of a Nation. It was published last year. She also has 14 books published. It's called, I just drank something sweet. I just drank something sweet, something with hope, something with promise. I drank this thing because I am fighting, fighting to remember the good of life and not drown in the bitter. I'm fighting to know what it means to drink tears that don't always taste of salt, struggling to remember crabs don't belong in barrels. I've been struggling with sorrow, her grip telling me my misery has become too commonplace. A house that was built by other hands, but demands we occupied all the same. And I pour out laughter in the air, hoping a garden of joy will grow, praying that something sweet don't turn to vinegar. Cause I'm fighting, fighting for something beyond this pain, something that will remind me that my smile doesn't have to be a masquerade that the crescent moon of my lips can be a truth that invokes revolutions. I want to sing, to dance, to shout, I will, I will drink something sweet, drink something full, drink something righteous, and I will fight because the sun sang warmth on my skin and I remember the spinning of webs in homage to a memory of salvation and I laugh. Vernacular needle and multiversal thread, my grandmother wove the sun for me. 
Embrace its golden light in your net. Bring it back to me. I, your daughter, plead with my tears. Lament, carrying the moon in my womb. Adorn the day and night as my flesh. Where is the honey mother that will sweeten this all? The world, is it dying? Is this the first time? The world, is it ending? Or is it just another empire? understand in this moment about the framework from whence I'm coming from is the framework of expansive imagination. So systems of oppression often, right, like systems of bureaucracy, systems of white supremacy, systems of classism, systems of racism, systems of anti-Blackness, systems of transphobia, systems of homophobia, systems of ableism, often try to deaden the imagination of folks who are forced to live within those systems. So it tries to tell us that like the solutions for, <laughs> the solutions for the very problems that these systems create are not possible. That's what it attempts to tell us. Expansive imagination, however, allows for us to imagine a world and imagine ourselves outside of these systems. And that the solutions that we need um, have already been born outside of them as well. So I think about Black trans people. And oftentimes people say to me, you know, you know, why every time you give a talk, you always got to talk about white supremacy and colonization. And so I would like to tell y'all a part of why I did that. <laughs> so I believe and I know that myself as a black trans person existing now, um, that I actually demonstrate I'm a living embodiment of what it means to actually engage expansive imagination. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that when Europeans colonized the world and they encountered what we now call as trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming folks, that European colonists specifically targeted folks like myself in those communities. Um, and that the system of colonization and the system of white supremacy dictates and says that someone like me should not exist. But here I am existing. So my very existence is proof of the expansive imagination of my Black Indigenous ancestors. So if it is true, that I, a black trans woman, can be sitting here on Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021, giving a keynote at Theodore Washington's summit. It is proof of the power of my ancestors being able to imagine worlds beyond what the system told them that they could. So today, as I talk about certain things, I just wanted to really make that clear that um, the, that the principle of expansive imagination, when a theater institution <laughs> or, um, you know, a bureaucratic system says no, when you actually are saying, well, let's actually engage in expansive imagination instead, right? What that means is, is that instead of saying no, specifically if you are like the head of a theater institution, say, how can we make that happen? So expansive Im imagination takes us from that realm of, no, that's impossible, that's impossible, that's impossible, to second, how can we make that happen? All right, y'all. So there were like several things that came up that folks probably will be talking about throughout the week, um, throughout the week, throughout the two days of the summit. 
I know. I'm so used to like conferences that be going on for like a week, child. I was like, throughout the week, wait, 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 second the summit. I also realized, right, that like, you know, the keynote at the beginning oftentimes typically like sets up folks for the conference, right? Um, and so I talked about our framework, right? The framework is expansive imagination. So that means that um, when you go into your sessions, when you go into your sessions, to figure out how to make the solutions actually work for you. Um, oh gosh. Okay. COVID-19. I think that it's probably, it probably is quite frankly, um, it probably would be irresponsible, I think, to have a conversation about theater but I want to mention it again. As artists continue to advocate on behalf of creatives to Actors' Equity for more equitable engagement with its membership, there's a large swath of artists who still can't meet the unreasonable demands not only Actors' Equity places on healthcare requirements, whether that be monetarily or otherwise, but those that the country puts on individuals to qualify for Medicaid. Healthcare is a human right. And I believe that if everyone in this country had healthcare, not just affordable, because affordable is relative, but free healthcare, it would greatly improve everyone's quality of life. Everybody, child, from the board down to the to to to, to the over hire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and let me first say, before I say this next part. That, that improving the quality of life of folks is enough, right? Like that reason is enough. And we could literally just stop there and be like, that's enough of a reason. Um, partially because systems of oppression often want us to have to like dictate to them why they should treat us humanely. And it's like, like they want us to prove and beg and plead with them like why we have to be treated like with some kind of human decency. And I'm like, child. Uh, but since this is a theater conference, I will also mention that in improving the quality of life of creatives, it allows for them to not have to, it allows for them to um, stop having to agonize over like that one thing, right? Like that, that eliminates one um, less thing from their list of things to have to worry about which could actually lead to more artists being able to tap into the fullness and freedom of their imaginations. So why am I talking about this? <laughs> I believe that theater institutions should also be thinking about ways to be in the fight for universal health care. While there are some people who say that is impossible, um, if we are to operate from the from the from the um, framework of expansive imagination, we know all things are possible. If universal health care was a fact of life, the equity scare that we had last year around like, you know, them trying to say y'all need to have more weeks, et cetera, et cetera, wouldn't have wouldn't have hit our community as hard as it did. How are we operating in community with one another beyond the scope of labor? I wanna um I wanna I wanna say that question one more time. How are we operating in community? How are we engaging in community with one another beyond the scope of labor? I'm just saying. Don't just care about artists when they're doing labor for you. <laughs> if we really a community, if we really a community. I want to talk a little bit about, um, as we talk about like, you know, equitable dis distribution of funds, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so one thing that um, I want to talk about on this particular panel, panel, it's a keynote, ciao. Child, as I talk about this, I want to talk about this one um, <clears throat> particular thing. I want to talk about possible travel funds. So I think 
to mention this. I'm not going to mention the theater. I'm not going to mention the board that I was having this conversation with. But also, as I talk about like the Black trans community, right, and I talk about how like trans people, indigenous trans people, Black trans people, how um, we really have been creating sustainable models of mutual aid um, for a very long time. So I was sitting in um, <clears throat> a meeting <clears throat> with a board um, and an artistic director. And one thing that I mentioned, right, is I mentioned um, this particular theater perhaps creating a travel fund for its creatives. And not just like the creatives who they um, book from out of town, but also the creators that are local. I think about often, right, like when we're having conversations about, um, when we're having conversations about like, oh, you know what, like our metro system is so, it's so efficient. It goes to all the places, right? Like it, it goes to everywhere. Um, but there have been at least two times on our metro system in which um, I encountered trans antagonism coming from a show at night, going home from a show. And so what I had proposed to this theater is I was like, you know, even if sometimes when like you have to go like one stop or you have to go like um, all the way out to Maryland, that sometimes public transportation is not always the safest. Now, I will say this, I'm also, saying to my folks who believe in um, a sustainable and equitable world that is green, that I would also love um, some reflections from them about how is it possible um, when we're talking about travel, right? How do we make sure um, even with the confines of us talking about how oftentimes um, traveling on bus or train is better for our environment. How do we also equate that with folks' safety as well? And so I think that this is the place where, as I think about my own, right? Like my own, like, oh, you know, okay, well, this may not necessarily be something that um, I may have the answer to, but... I do know that there are people who work in making sure that we are having a green theater, green theater spaces that can help me with that. I do, however, think that that theaters um, who have the finances to do so, and y'all know what I mean by that. I do think that they should also be offering stipends for travel also for their local artists. Not just for out-of-town folks, just because equ equity told you to. So, you know, that's that on that. Um, I've got about three more minutes before I enter into conversation with <clears throat> uh, my good, good sisters. I want to talk about pouring into the local pool of artists. Do it, do it, do it. Um, this is what I wrote up about that. I often think about water, right? And how I was once told about how water moves from rivers to bigger bodies of water, how rain, right, pours itself into rivers and bigger bodies of water and how water is cycling through itself, right, natural bodies of water. <laughs> and I think about what it means to be a part of a theater community with so many brilliant creators who have often had to scrape and bag in order to get the resources and access to the theater institutions that are sitting right in their communities. I bring this up because I know there are a number of theater institutions that often hire um, from and work with local artists. Yes, I understand that but there are also a number of theater institutions who do not. I think, for example, about playwriting. When we are looking at 
the local playwrights around us who have been the most produced, more than likely um, that said local playwright is a man. And then when we look even closer, that said playwright is a white cis head man. What would happen, you know, as we're talking about inclusion, et cetera, what would happen if there was a component of playwright developing that specifically centered local voices and also at least attempted to have one local playwright in each of their seasons? While this may seem like a lofty aspiration, how do we as a community truly rally around local playwrights so that their work is as celebrated as playwrights who may have been on Broadway or may come from New York? I also think uh, that, that this particular question can be assigned to nearly every profession in the theater world in DC. How are institutions seeing themselves as part of community, not simply machines that have to turn out white gaze centered plays after white gaze centered plays? Um, Anti racism. Okay. So, anti racism work. So anti-racism, I think that I think that we are clear, right? That anti-racism is a proxis, right? That it is it, that that as much as that as much as theater institutions can release statements about we we are in solidarity with George Floyd's family and the black community, and we're in solidarity with like Tony McDade's family and the black trans community, right? That really. Um, when we look at the history of theater institutions and we look at their engagements with communities, there is no reason for Black and Indigenous communities to have faith that theater will change its tune as soon as um, there is the ability to go back to some semblance of normal. So here are some things that like, I think about. Who has the power in the room? Who has the power in the room? What world do you envision when you envision the world? So I will, okay. Mm, okay, so listen, all right, listen. Okay, y'all, listen. I am not saying this because I believe in counsel and canceling the writer of this piece. I'm saying this because it is a prominent, it is a prominent example of what happens when theater institutions actually fail theater communities. Recently, one of our favorite musicals was made into a movie. It is no secret, we know it was in the Heights. Also along with that, um, making in the Heights in the move into a movie, we witnessed once again, anti-Blackness on display. There were no dark-skinned, Black, Latinx people, Afro-Latinx people as leads. Um, and so as I think about, right, several things. In envisioning that world for In the Heights, who did they actually see? When you're envisioning the world, folks who are, who are here at the summit, who are you envisioning? Are, are you saying that Black and dark-skinned people are the background in your story? Do you actually envision Black people when you envision a world for yourself? A world of tomorrow, a world of today? Um. I think about um, who the casting director was for In the Heights. It was white people. <laughs> I'll tell you who it was. It was white people. So there was a failing there, right? Um, operate like engaging a casting director who was not 
even invested in any kind of expansive idea of the world. I think about the fact that as there was the there was the conversation around in the heights that this goes back to who has the power in the room and Rita Moreno made her statement, right? One thing that Rita Moreno said that was very telling to me and that I clocked when she was defending Lynn Manuel. Also, I heard Lynn Manuel is perfectly nice. This is not me saying we need to cancel him. Okay. Heard he's a perfectly nice person. She said, folks can't blame him for something he had no control over. So, okay, you know, in this moment, right, in this moment, grace, in this moment, grace, right? If that is a truth, right, then the question is, who holds the power in the room? Who holds that power? Who was responsible for it? So I say this to artistic directors. When you are offering notes about a play, is that based on your misunderstanding of culture? Is it based on wanting to center the white gaze? Is it based on your misunderstanding of style? Lastly, the thing I wanna say about this in this moment. <laughs> Another thing that came up, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that people said, Lynn Manuel, you cannot treat Lynn Manuel like he is the only, right? Like he is the only, that's the next person. You can't treat him like he is the 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 um the reported savior of BIPOC representation. And so this, I want to get into marketing and the ways in which theater institutions have historically erased, sabotaged, and neglected Black and Indigenous voices, Black and Indigenous creatives. The only reason why the world could ever suspect or believe that Lin-Manuel could possibly be the savior of BIPOC representation is because before he got to Hollywood, theater institutions purposefully marketed him that way. Theater institutions purposefully marketed his work that way. Theater institutions purposefully invested in making the Latinx community seem like a monolith. Not until perhaps three years ago, did I see Latinx people who look like myself actually be cast as Latinx people? And so if theater institutions were doing their work like they were supposed to be doing their anti-racism, Equitable, equi 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 equity and inclusion work, diversity and inclusion work, they would have never been as irresponsible as to market him as, as a thing that he could never live up to because his view of the world is limited when we're talking about Blackness. So what is the responsibility of theater institutions, particularly given the knowing that now Hollywood is asking for Black, Brown, and Indigenous playwrights to come write for Hollywood, what is the responsibility of theater institutions to create a truthful and community-based marketing plan around those artists that is not about trying to appear woke. Thank you so much. I would like to invite to the stage in this moment, Farah and Regina, so we can continue this keynote 
via conversation. I was like, let me fix my face. <laughs> <laughs> all right, once Dane gets in the room, we'll start. Thank you all for being patient. So as you can see, we're working with a platform that's a lot more complicated than Zoom. So has a lot of beautiful features, but work with us. It's our first. Uh, <laughs> we all here. Thank we God. We here. <laughs> we made it. We made it. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, Dane. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, my name is Farrah Lawal Harris. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm one of the co-chairs of this year's DC Theater Summit. And I'm joined with. I'm Regina Aquino. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am so honored to be on stage with these two glorious women. Um, after quite a bit of time um, working and collaborating with the community and, and creating this space with everybody on screen and behind the scenes, Ryan, thank you for for handling um, all of the technical challenges of this massive platform. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you, Lady Dane, for everything that you just said and have, have always said on all the work that you continue to do for this community and beyond. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Dane, I have pages and pages of notes. So <laughs> I was just writing was, everything. There What's that? There was a question in the. There was a question in the that maybe I should answer because I told yeah. them I would answer it on. So someone said, "How do artists, playwrights reclaim authority over their work?" Um, you have to go into meetings with theater institutions knowing that like you are the gift, and that it actually is a, and that it is actually a a privilege for them to produce your work. And so when I go into a theater institution. I, I often go in there with expansive imagination. How are we actually pouring into community? What is that? Like, these are questions that I ask. I went into a meeting with Long Wharf Theater and I tell folks, I went into that meeting, a director, and I left a producer hmm. because I actually told Long Wharf that they had to, um, if they wanted to center Black trans women, that we had to create a whole event around it. And we had to actually commission Black trans women. And now Long Wolf has agreed to make that an annual event. So like go into these meetings that you have with these theaters that you are the gift and that you have the right um, to center your vision for your play. Awesome, thank you. Um, the first question I had, um, you spoke about joy and the message from your ancestors. You said your sorrow is not more sacred than your joy. And that spoke to me on a lot of levels, on personal levels, you know, especially with the last year and a half we've had, but also just with the type of um, representation that people like us tend to have on stage. And I wonder for you, what are your sources of joy, especially in this time where a lot of people have a hard time finding joy? Where do you look for joy in your life or just in your spirit? Yeah, um, you know, I have had the, I've had the, the blessing to be able to cultivate authentic, loving, um, and expansive relationships with amazing um, folks. I mean, you and Regina are a part of, you know, my sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I could, I could talk about lots of things, right? Like, you know, reading all these other things, but I think that, that realistically um, part of that is being able to like really have community, really have sisters and siblings who are invested, not just in my survival, but also in my thriving. Mm. Real authentic, loving relationships. 
Yeah, you about to make me cry too. Oh <laughs> Virginia, I, 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 I wasn't sure what it was gonna happen. <laughs> I'm shocked it didn't happen during the keynote, but now that like we're we're like zeroing in on things, I just uh, I, I think you knew that I was gonna at some point. I might as well get it out of the way. <laughs> Regina, do you have a question for Dane? Um, I just wanted to, you know, th there was so much that really resonated with me, but one of the things that I am um, facing very, very soon is the loss of insurance. And uh, I don't think that I heard nearly enough people talking about how theaters and, and the union should be um, advocating for uni universal health care uh, during the pandemic. Um, all I really heard about was the fight with SAG over what contract goes where. And I'm one of the, the few lucky actors who, who has been able to utilize equity insurance, which has saved me a lot of money. And I'm also one of the few lucky performers who was able to work on equity contracts over the pandemic. But based on the challenges that, that equity is enduring, because of the pandemic, sure, and the loss of income. Um, insurance is harder for me to get. And I unfortunately live in a state that is still working on, um, uh, like Virginia just doesn't have reasonable rates in terms of universal healthcare. And it, like, it's, I think there are, I don't know, 10 states that have not, um, that have not joined the federal marketplace and Virginia is still working towards that. So you can have people within the DC, Maryland, Virginia area facing very different choices with regards to affordable health care when you run out of um, insurance. And I lose my insurance in October. So I'm like really trying to think about what I'm going to do um, and how I'm going to uh, survive. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing that up among all of the other things because because, yeah, I mean, I, there's not really a question there, but just how powerful, um, how powerful that is. And, and if I am facing it, I'm sure there are so many other people who are facing it, too. So thank you for naming that. And, 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 and thank you for, for just mentioning all the different ways that we as artists are affected. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one minor injury at a dance call and what happens? Yeah, I think that it's important for, um, you know, when we talk about theater institutions, and I get theater institutions also are not a monolith, right? Like, let me just say that as well. Like, I, I get that, y'all. Because some people are like, not my institution. We be trying, right? And I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, but we are in relationship to one another, right? And so um what i mean by that is that like there are theater institutions in dc who whose funders and also board members are actually in the rooms with the people who are determining whether or not the country has universal health care um and i feel like those theater institutions have a responsibility to actually utilize their access to really try to fight for effective change, not just to get funding to do Brigadoon. That was me being shady. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody doing Brigadoon here, but I was just being <laughs> But y'all know what I mean, right? I think that it's an illusion to believe that these worlds, particularly in the DMV, particularly in DC, that, 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 that the world of politics and and theater is, is, is somehow separate from each other. The Capitol's right down the street. <laughs> Very true. Um, you were talking, Dane, about um, just the fact that the CDC numbers for um, vaccinations haven't been reached, but a lot of theaters are rushing to open the doors again. Everyone's excited to get back to a semblance of normalcy. Um, and one of the questions you asked of theaters, you know, you said, what does it look like for institutions to work together and also to ask artists what safety means to them? And I'm wondering for you as a freelance artist, personally, what does safety look like to you in this landscape that we're in within the pandemic and with um, work soon returning to being in person for a lot of the institutions in our area? Yeah, um, I was I was just laughing, y'all, because running my head. <laughs> 
<laughs> said next season at Theater Lines, bring it to <laughs> uh, uh, Raymond is also the other keynote speaker. He'll be um, closing out the conference with a keynote. <laughs> He's also my brother. Um, theater Lines was also the first theater to um, offer a world premiere of my work. So that is exciting. Uh, um, work Theater Lines. And I also know that they are a theater that is that is rooted in community. So shout out to Theater Alliance. And they've been doing some amazing work over the pandemic. Safety for me. Oh, my God. Sis, that's a whole workshop. Um, so... <laughs> Um, one thing that I think is like super, super important for me is like talking about this travel fund, right? Like I am someone who does not drive a car. I do not know how to drive a car. Um, <clears throat> my partner works, so he can't always come and pick me up and things, right? Um, and so like th this travel fund is deeply important to me because sometimes because the Metro is not always safe for um, black trans people, um, I sometimes have to catch lifts. And so like when you're getting paid from a theater, even if you're getting paid like a thousand bucks, right. A, a week. And half of that is going towards travel back and forth to the theater. You still got to pay rent. You still got to eat. You still and it and if you make too much money over the threshold of Medicaid health insurance, you still have to pay the five k a year for health insurance, and then pay a copay on top of that. And if you are getting equity health insurance, you still got to pay out your check for that health insurance. <laughs> a lot of money. So um, for me, it's like you know, like having an additional fund that is set aside simply for travel that does not have to come out of my paycheck is, is it, it, it ensures that like I get to make the choice right around how I want to travel to and from the work and what is safest for me. So I think that it's in, I think it's an individual question for individual people. And I invite for theaters to really, really think about um, really actually engaging their individual creatives around those types of questions. Yes, present your safety plans and also say, what is safety for you? <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, I forgot to mention too, for folks who are in the room, if you have any questions for Dane, please put them in the white question box. Um, yeah, I see a comment from Scott saying Metro in DC is also crazy, crazy expensive. And dare I say, and I want to yeah. say like Scott, you know, I love Scott. Scott's my brother. I want to also, also, also say, right, that like we also have to sometimes like recognize the language that we use. Like, don't say it, it's not it's not that it's crazy. Right. Like be be very specific because like using the term crazy um, for some folks in the in the disabled community is ableist. Right. And, and it's super offensive. So I would say, say what it is. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It can be a dangerous experience for lots of people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Regina, did you have anything that you wanted to ask then? Yeah, I, uh, I did. Um, so, you know, over the many years that I have um, been uh, fortunate enough to be mentored by you and your activism and, and just in your, in your producing and your writing and having, having all of your nurturing, um, one of the most brilliant things that you have given me is, uh, is the gem of teaching me that theater is community, that theater doesn't exist in a building, that that's not what theater is, that it's people, that we, this community gathered here virtually, I, I'm in France, like I am not in anywhere near you, but I am in community with you and, and that this community exists whether I can physically be in the room with you or not. Um, you know, so that brings up a lot of questions about what is in-person theater, what is virtual theater, and, and all of these things that have expanded in terms of what discipline is, right? But you you mentioned community again, and like one of the things that, that I firmly believe now is that theater should reflect the community in which it stands. Otherwise, if it does not, that theater should not exist. And you mentioned in your keynote that um, that you you posited that question: Are you in community 
with Black and Indigenous Indigenous populations. And so I, I wanted to know how how do you envision ways like if if theater companies, which are primarily white institutions in this city, not all of them, but most of them, especially the really well funded, well marketed, highly accessible ones, um, I I wonder if you you had any thoughts for them about what community actually looks like? And I know that we've started that in terms of this travel fund or really advocating for healthcare, but are there are there other more grassroots efforts and individual ways that they can support communities and, and artists and, and, and um, contractors? Yeah, I think um, several things. So I think that one, like what shows are you doing? Who are you hiring? Whose who's, who's voice are you listening to? Because it's not enough to just put black, brown and indigenous people on stage, right? Like, are they being tokenized? So I think that like for those theaters that are, you know, quote, quote unquote, well-funded, <clears throat> I think that those theaters, um, have to also look about who who are they getting their funds from? Are they getting their funds from uh, uh, corporations and funders who actually are um, advocating for the oppressions that impact their black, brown and indigenous, either their people who work at the theater as like staff or artists who come and work at the theater on a one-off show, right? Like, um, and if they are getting their money from them, you know, there are some folks who say you shouldn't be, right? You shouldn't be. And then there are some folks who say, well, where are you putting those funds at? Because if you are getting your funds from a corporation that you know ain't shit, oh, can I cuss? Uh, And then that money is going right back to white people. Dang. That is not that is not reappropriating resources. That's not re re like, you know, that's not giving resources to the communities that are most impacted by the oppressions of of the of these corporations. Um, I also think about like also they need to be honest about who they are. If they're not in, invested in having a democratic theater, if they're not invested in being a part of community, say that. Don't release a statement when George Floyd is killed and say you're in solidarity with us when you're really not, because that's bullshit. And Black people know the difference. Indigenous people know the difference. Asian people know the difference. So I say, like, be who the fuck you say you, oh my gosh, be who you say you are. Yeah, okay. Be, <laughs> be who you say you are. Or don't. But don't fake the funk, baby. Don't fake the funk. Um, and there are already people who are doing amazing work that's telling people how to be in solidarity with them. Like, don't just have a land acknowledgement. Are you actually, like, donating a part of your ticket, your ticket prices to indigenous, the indigenous community where you're where your um, theater rest. I know folks in the Piscataway tribe. So if you need a contact where you wanna donate a portion of your ticket funds, I can connect you to them. Those are the types of things I'm talking about. Like put your money where your mouth is because we live in a capitalistic society. And until theater institutions wanna talk about us living in a society that's more equitable monetarily, then they need to operate with um with some form of intentionality around the truth that we live in a capitalistic society someone had a question y'all you see this over here i can answer it sure you mind reading the question aloud first thing yeah how forthright should we be with theaters about the obstacles we might face during the run of the show for example travel funds or maybe the amount of work we have to do outside of the show rehearsals to make ends meet I say be forthright and that the theater institution, right, can like cho can choose, right, 
to to engage you in a way that is um that is expansive or not but one thing that will be very certain is that you will know the politics of that theater institution from that in, from that um from that interaction <clears throat> can i also um jump in on that yeah um i i i co-sign that absolutely be forthright um you know, one of the things that I have noticed, particularly even during the pandemic, because, hey, like during the pandemic, we all lost work and finding work that was safe was very difficult. Um, but at the same time, theaters were also reaching out to everybody, particularly equity actors like myself, that non-equity theaters sometimes just can't afford because of the equity requirements. Um, but towards the beginning of the pandemic, I noticed that a lot of non-equity theaters were reaching out to equity actors to get them to work for them um, on these Zoom productions that weren't really heavily regulated that, at that time. And I was looking at the funds that they were offering. And uh, at one point I was offered, I was offered a job that wanted 20, over 20 hours of my time. When I did the math uh, with regards to that stipend, it worked out to be $2.50 an hour. And, and and that was 20 hours of rehearsal and then the performance. And I was like, mm, is that is that fair? Like, do you think that that's fair? And if you can't pay, and this is something that I started to, I, I started doing this even before the pandemic, whatever the equity minimum is or whatever they're offering you, I need to make a certain amount per hour in order to pay my bills. I'm a single mother with two kids. And, and I flat out say my, my, part-time job that I do remotely and from the safety of my home at any time of day pays me $16 an hour. So if you're not going to help compensate for that loss of income and pay me at least, oh, at least $17 an hour, I can't take your job. And if you can't make that happen, I need the time in terms of rehearsal, I need I need internet access. I need to know where there's parking. I need to know all of these different things in order to make the decision as to whether or not your theater has my livelihood centered in this process at all. Because if it doesn't, I'm I'm not interested in working for you. Like if you can't pay, and in DC, the, if minimum wage is now $15, why are theaters thinking that they can offer less than $15? I just I just don't understand. Even for virtual work, work is work. Pay artists their money. Also, the rent in DC be shady boots, baby. <laughs> shady boots, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, one thing I was wondering, Dane. So uh, maybe a month ago or so, you had written a beautiful how round article about. Um, the world that you imagine without, why is my printer on? Sorry. <laughs> the world you imagine without oppression. And you spoke today a lot about um, expansive imagination. And I wonder what um, words you have for people who come from marginalized communities who don't always feel like we can be expansive in our imaginations because of the oppression that surrounds us, because of the violence that surrounds us the hatred and lack of opportunity. Um, Cause admittedly, especially last year, my imagination was very limited at the start of this pandemic. I was so disappointed and low because of just a series of events that happened that even for me as a creative, I could be imaginative for a play commission, but in my own life, in my own dreaming, I had a very hard time. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I know if I went through that, I couldn't have been the only one. So I wonder what words you have for people in those situations? Um, several things. Oh my goodness. Everything you just, you, you just mentioned, like so much was, was, was like, um, first of all, rest, rest. Capitalism says that <laughs> capitalism equates black people, especially resting with violence because capitalism believes that everyone, but especially black people because of um, the history of cattle, uh, chattel slavery here in this country, 
that when Black people rest, it is being anti-American. It's being anti all of these things. And so like in those moments, right, I say, is what's actually happening is that your heart is asking for you to take the time you need to process what you need to process. And how are you going to do that when you continue to only focus on, um, when you continue to only see your way through, through production? As opposed to maybe in those moments, what you were being asked to do is to really take time to sit with your heart and prioritize that. And that if the world was right, right? <laughs> if the world was free of oppression, if <laughs> theater itself, right, was not um, was not suffocating under the capitalistic oppressive system model, that you would have actually been able to name your need to really rest and process, and community and community would have rallied around you. So when I think about this idea of like, you know, how can we dream even in living in the realities that we live in? I say, community, how are we making spaces for the most vulnerable, the most impacted by structural oppression um, to be able to do that, right? I reflect that question back out to the community. How are we showing up for ourselves, absolutely, and also community. Two, um, we are not our trauma. We are not our trauma. There are some new age, hippy dippy, sage and crystal <laughs> folks who, you know, who try to pull this thing of, you know, trying to make us be grateful for the trauma that happened to us. No. Could you imagine? We'd be already, we'd be already traversing deep space if black, brown, indigenous babies wasn't having to like, wasn't being traumatized by the state because they'd actually be given the resources to be able to actually create the things that are in their imaginations without having to scrape and beg and plead. Could you imagine what would happen in those moments with people's, um, with people's engagement with other folks? It wouldn't be fraught with an idea of competition or a mentality of like scarcity. Everybody would be eating. Everybody would be eating as much as they need to. Everybody would have a roof over their head and everybody would be able to actually engage their gifts in a way that was completely and fully expansive and celebrate it. We are not our trauma. And I think that like, you know, that's a part of what the ancestors were saying to me. Your sorrow is not more sacred than your joy. That yes, do the work that you need to heal in those moments. And also know that you have the right to name your needs, to center yourself, <clears throat> and to demand a world that is equitable. And to dream, to dream. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a question from Calvin. Um, what advice would you offer to artists who have gotten lost in the quote unquote old world who want to make space for themselves in this new world where we can fully be who we are with, out of the white gaze? Ooh. Um. What advice would you offer to artists who have gotten lost in the old world, who want to make space for themselves in this new world where we can fully be who we are out of the white gaze? 
Who are you? Who are you? And then once you, right, once you really, 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 right, know that that knowing who you are is also um is also for some folks a journey, right? Like because you are having to wade through all of the, all of that extra, right? To really get to the core. But when you actually get a glimmer of that, I say allow for that glimmer to continue to expand and do not compromise. Do not compromise. If it is important for you to be, right, your full self, once you have found yourself, and I mean truly found yourself, don't let yourself go. Because what systems will do, right, is that they will demand that you let yourself go, but then they don't arm you with the tools to find yourself again. But you know who did arm you with the tools? Your Black ancestors. <laughs> Your black ancestors did. So part of that is part of that envisioning, right? Is really, really, really envisioning yourself outside of these systems. Thank you. I wrote in the chat um, also to check out Erica Totten's Instagram. It's at to live unchained. Uh, she has resources for writing a I am statement. And that's something that I had to do to figure out who I was outside of what I do, what I produce, and it's life changing. So I recommend that for anybody who's trying to figure out who they are outside of what these systems are. We love Erica Titan. We do. <laughs> we do. We love Erica Titan. <laughs> cool. Regina? Um. I wrote down something that you said last year uh, that I think really resonates um, in this moment. And uh, I'm with everything that you said, but in particular, what you just said about ancestors. Last year, during uh, a round table, you said, theater at its heart is spiritual. Theater has the responsibility of being at the forefront of social justice and change. And um, every time I read that, like, it's just a reminder that the work that we do, the work that you do, the work that we do as artists, as theater practitioners, as storytellers, is sacred. And um, that's something that you consistently remind me of, that, that our bodies, our stories, our makeup is sacred. And it's these systems that devalue us and we are just trying to survive. So we acclimate to these systems and we internalize it as normal, but it is abnormal. It is abnormal to bend ourselves to these systems. And, and I, just, I just wanted to, I wanted to put that out there and share it with all of these people, that brilliant thing that you said in passing at a round table last year, Thank you for always, always dropping gems all the time and making me cry even a year later. <laughs> oh my gosh, thanks. Girl, don't let me don't let me talk. Like I just cry the whole time. You know how to moderate. I just get emotional. No, I love I, you know, I love you. I love you so much, Regina. And is it possible for me to share just like a little bit of what we talked about one time in your car when we were talking about playwriting and what I told you to do? Oh, okay. What, what did you uh, about, tell me to do? About tapping into your own ancestry? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Sure, sure, uh, sure. <laughs> so I remember like, you know, so Regina and I have known each other for a very long time, y'all. Like, uh, Regina is someone who, as far as acting is concerned, um, was someone who, um, <clears throat> that was a younger actor. <laughs> but I can still play 21, okay? Um, so, 
black don't crack um was someone who was a huge inspiration for me and so uh maybe like two years ago regina and i were in her car she was driving me home from something that we were like having dinner with a bunch of friends or something and i just said to her you know we were talking about like representation we were talking about specifically like asian representation on stage and we were talking about like um filipina representation on stage and i remember i was like girl write this write that show i said girl write the show you want to see i said write that one person show that that digs into your ancestry and that talks about you know um your people that's like a short of like the long expansive conversation we had because that's the that's the right that's probably the only thing I can really share in a public forum. But like, I remember you know with Clyde M. Nastra, right? Um, that won a Helen Hayes Award. Um, so I remember with Clyde M. Nastra, like part of you know, which started me writing Clyde M. Nastra all those years ago, was the fact that I was not. I was not seeing black trans women on stage. And and I knew that like I wanted to be a leading lady in theater. And that like if a theater was not going to hire me at that moment to do it, I would have to write my own show. And I would have to tell the story about about black folks the way that I wanted to tell the story about black folks. And so and then, right, it might have took a long time for a theater to finally take a chance on it. Shout out to Theater Alliance. But that space, that creative space was also really beautiful. The rehearsal process, I mean, the rehearsal process, like the people who were in the rehearsal day to day, which was um, the two stage managers, the director, myself, the assistant director, and Autumn, who was who was my um, co-star on the show, uh, she played drums. I think she's on a panel too. Um, that whole room was people of color. There was, and the majority of those people were black. And that really was like the first time I think when I'm thinking back on like the career, my my theater career, where like. Our our like day to day rehearsal room was that, and and black women were leading the room, leading. Um, and then when I when I when we branch out and we look at the creative team, the creative team was filled with gender expansiveness. So. Writing Clyde Nastra helped to lead me to that room that reflected how I wanted a room to look. So I also tell, you know, I also, y'all know, I'm always telling y'all all the time, I'm always like, you know, I'm like, write that joint. And also the second component to that, right, <clears throat> is that it's not just enough to say, write it, right? Because I think that, you know, sometimes we'll look at um, when we critique like Hollywood or we critique certain things in theater, people will be like, well, why y'all not writing it, right? If y'all write it, then y'all can blah, blah, blah. The second component to that is we understand that, that the producing of theater requires resources. So this is when I talk about like the community. How were theater institutions in community with, with, with expansive writers <laughs> to then make sure that they get the resources to really workshop and produce the play. Because Theater Alliance gave me two workshops. So it can be done. It can be done, honey. We created the model, honey. <laughs> 
So, you know, as I think about it, right, like as I think about it, I'm also like, okay, yes, Regina, write your play. And then also turning, you know, turning the mirror back to the for, to the theater institutions who are in the community. And then how are y'all going to actually like make sure that Regina gets the resources that she needs to workshop and get the play produced? And not, you know, and not just Regina, I'm using Regina in this instance because we were just talking about your play, but also like there are lots of amazing playwrights who are creating expansive stories. And the only thing that they do not have is the resources. And so if you, th if you theater institution have the resources to be able to actually tell the type of stories that is transformational to black, brown and indigenous communities, Oh, it, no, I'm not going to say that part. It's fine. Nope. Go ahead. Go ahead, y'all. Go ahead, y'all. <laughs> um, I do see a quick question. I know we need to wrap soon because we have an 1130 session, but somebody asked anonymously, what if you are not a writer? What if you are not a writer? Um, <clears throat> and so I think like, hold on. So what are we talking about? So in the sense of what? In the sense of what? I think that was in relation to when you were telling um, Regina to write that show, tell your own oh, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by that? I guess like, I guess um, for me, I guess because I do so many things, right? Oh, you're an actor, not a writer. What if you are not a writer? Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, if you are an actor and you're not a writer, so this is something that like Issa Rae talked about a lot, right? Is that like she... <laughs> She talked about how, you know, her show Insecure started with um, her show Awkward Black Girl and how she actually um, cr created like a, a kind of like a community of artists around her that then some of those artists went, went with her to Insecure. So I say this, like if you are an actor and you are really invested in being a part of stories, um, being a part of certain types of stories that that are not being produced in theater, um, I say find you a writer who's writing those types of stories and see if you can be in community with that writer, um, and see if they actually would, um, you know, let you actually do like a reading for them in their living, well, in their living room virtually, right? Like we're talking when I say living room, I mean virtual. You know, be a part of a cast of. Uh, of folks in their living room. I do know that there are a lot of writers who oftentimes, um, before they even get like a workshop, they'll do like a reading in their living room. They'll offer like, it'll be like a cold reading. They'll offer like a stipend to their friends, right? Sometimes it's only like $25. That's because people, you know, people are trying the best they can sometimes in their real life because, you know, economic violence. Um, but it allows for that writer to be able to actually um, hear their play out loud um, and work some of their play out. So I say like, you know, who are your artistic community? Who's your artistic family? Um, there are some actors who have been in my life for a very long time. And, you know, if I, when I get workshops and stuff, I'm like, hey, actor, like, hey, you were, you know, you were reading plays of mine <laughs> At the tea shop, come and um, come and do this reading here at this other place where you actually can get some coin, right? Thank you for like reading that at the tea shop for two dollars. <laughs> can you come and do this thing? So I think if yeah, it's like who's your artistic family? Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, everything. For oh, what were you gonna say, Regina? Well, I just wanted to add on like when Dane told me that I needed to write that story. I think I pretty much replied, I'm an actor, not a writer. I don't know how to write. Um, and I think I, I think that just sat with me for a very long time. When the pandemic hit, I wrote, I, I wrote something and then I've recently been commissioned. Like I, I don't feel like a writer, but my artistic family, which Dane just suggested we all find, my artistic family, Lady Dane, told me that I should do something that I didn't give my, myself permission to think that I could do. Um, so, you know, I used to walk around all the time and say, I'm not a director, I'm an actor. I'm not a writer, I'm an actor. Because that's all I really wanted to be. But somehow a story found its way out of me. And um, I know that there are more. 
Uh, so, you know, that, that, that is always like growth is something that may happen for you too. And like expansion, um, but because of that, like I'm still stumbling through it. I know that this question was asked anonymously, um, but you can reach out to me and I'm happy to talk about it and help in any way that I can, uh, the same way that Dane has invested and helped me. I think that we all sort of pay it forward. Um, I'd love to be in conversation with whoever you are. Okay, now you were saying. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to end it and to push forward what Dane's message was about community and mutual aid. So thank you for that, Regina. Thank you, Dane, for all of the gems that you've dropped. Uh, thank you for being not only a gift to this community, but personally a gift to me. You add so much value to my life and my artistic community. So I appreciate you. I love you. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in this morning. Um, we hope that you join us for the rest of the summit. We have our next session at 1130. Um, so in a few minutes, it's a conversation on agency self-producing. So we hope that you tune in for that session. Thank you, Ryan, for running the tech. We know this ain't easy, so we appreciate you. Uh, Regina and Dan, do you have any closing words for everybody? I was going to say thank you to the both of you. Um, Y'all have also been um, so incredible in my life. And so thank you. Um, I, it's like, you know, um, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the ways in which y'all have shown up for me um, and the love that you have poured into me. So thank the both of you and congratulations on an amazing, um, you know, start to what I know will be an incredible, an incredible summit. Thanks to both of you for co-chairing. And thank y'all for tuning in today. Love y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, y'all.